Good evening, everyone. I'm Margaret Andera, Interim Chief Curator and Curator of Contemporary Art at the Museum. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the third installment of Curated Conversations, a series of talks with the museum's curators in which they discuss their current projects and interests. Tonight, we're going to hear from Nikki Otten, our Associate Curator of Prints and Drawings. And she's going to give us a behind the scenes look at the recently acquired James and Susie Wickman collection, an extraordinary gift of nearly 600 posters, prints, and drawings by the French artist Jules Charest. And I'm going to say right now, Nikki's pronunciation of his name is far better than mine is. She's also going to tell us about her work on the exhibition celebrating that gift entitled Always New, the posters of Jules Charest, which will open in the museum's Baker Rowland Galleries in June of next year. Before I introduce Nikki, I wanna say a word about the format for the event tonight. Nikki will give her presentation and after she has finished, there will be time for questions. So at any time during her presentation, you can submit a question via the chat feature. And at the conclusion of Nikki's presentation, I'll ask any of the questions that have been submitted. Now, I know some of you already know Nikki, but for those who may not, Nikki Otten is the museum's associate curator of prints and drawings. She's been very busy since joining the museum in 2018. She curated the Landfall Press Five Decades of Printmaking exhibition in 2019 and has also organized several focus exhibitions drawn from the museum's collection. Previously, Otten held fellowships and internships at the Weissman Museum Art Museum at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, the Chrysler Museum of Art in Norfolk, Virginia, and the Minneapolis Institute of Art. She holds a PhD in art history from the University of Minnesota, where she completed her dissertation that examines how the telescope and the microscope influenced symbolist artistic vision in the 19th century. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Nikki. Thank you. I was trying to figure out how to tell you I couldn't unmute myself without talking. So. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Margaret, for that introduction. And thank you, everyone, for joining me this evening. So as Margaret said, I'll be telling you a little bit about organizing the upcoming exhibition called Always New. And I'll also tell you a little bit more about the gift from James and Susie Wickman and about some of the work that we've been doing behind the scenes over the past few years to welcome that gift into the collection. To start off, I'll give you a little bit of background about Jules Charest because he is an important figure not only in printmaking, but also within modern art more generally. So Chéret was born in Paris in 1836, and he apprenticed with a lithographer at the age of 13. And shortly after that, he went on to go to print and design decorative lettering, decorative motifs, and sheet music covers. And I'm showing you a photograph of him in his studio from either the late 1890s or early 1900s. And you can see that um, as he grew into his career, he was interested in presenting himself as quite a well-rounded cultured gentleman. So you can see there's a lute in the background. He has a couple of fencing appies behind him and a little fencing glove. That's what that hand-like thing near the floor is. And I selected this photograph because there are two posters behind him and both of those posters that are on the wall are also part of the Jim and Susie Wickman collection. So Chile is widely regarded now and was also in his lifetime as being the inventor of the color illustrated poster. And that was a result of some time that he spent in London. He moved to London in 1859 after he had started his printing career in Paris. And while he was in London, he met and started working for fellow French expatriate and cosmetics 
person, <laughs> Eugène Remel, so of Remel Cosmetics. So for Remel, Chéret produced packaging and also some small chromolithograph promotional materials. And it was while he was in London that Chéret came up with the idea of producing posters for the streets of Paris. So he would have seen illustrated posters like the image on the left while he was in London. And prior to Chéret posters, existed, but they tended to be more text heavy. And if there were illustrations incorporated into the poster, they were usually smaller and printed from a woodcut, which is what you're seeing on the left. And then in contrast, the image on the right is one of Chéret's earliest printed lithographs. And you can see from this design that there's quite a lot more emphasis on the illustration versus the text. And that he has an interest in integrating the text with the illustrations. So this poster was done in 1868, just two years after Chéret returned to, London, to Paris after his time in London. Once he got back, he established his own press with funds that Plumel had provided, and he started to embark upon his project of producing these large-scale illustrated colored posters for the streets of Paris. And Chéret came up with an innovative technique for printing that was done from three stones. So it's a three stone lithography process where he printed in black and red inks on a graduated background that goes from kind of yellow or red at the bottom to blue or green at the top. And you can see that technique in practice in these two posters that I'm showing you on the screen. And that process of printmaking was really important because lithography is somewhat of an involved process. So I will explain to you how it works using this color lithograph by Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec as an example. So lithography is based on the principle that oil and water repel each other. The way that it works is that the artist will draw a design on a prepared slab of limestone, which you can see there on the press. Once the artist is finished with their design, the printer will chemically process the stone in order to make the non-image areas more receptive to water and the image areas more receptive to grease. Once that chemical processing is finished, the printer will wet the stone with a sponge. So they put a thin film of water over the top of the stone and then they use a roller to put ink on top of the stone as well. Then the areas of the stone that were chemically processed to be more receptive to water absorb the water and repel the ink, and the greasy image areas attract the ink and repel the water, so the ink only goes on the image areas. Then the printer runs the stone through the press under high pressure, and you end up with your image on the other side. And that's the process for creating a lithograph in one color and you need to repeat that entire process for each additional color that you want to add. So every color in a color lithograph is printed from a separate stone. So you keep running the same piece of paper through the press over and over again on top of different stones. So as you can tell from that <laughs> process, minimizing the number of times that the paper needed to go through the press would help to save time and money. And creating that three stone lithography process helped Chéret to be able to create advertisements for events and products that were very short lived. And here is an example of how a color lithograph would have been built up throughout the printing process. So you can see just the yellow applied to the paper on the far left top. Then you add the red stone, the black stone on the side it, um, would then be overlaid on top of the red and yellow and then green to finalize the image. So this is a little bit later, slightly more complex, but you get a sense of how it would work. So Chéré had his own press that he managed for about 15 years in different locations throughout Paris. And then in 1881, he merged with a company called Imprimerie Chez. And Shea was a company that printed railroad maps and timetables. And Chéret became the artistic director of Shea. And as such, he had access to quite an expansive fleet of presses and also a large staff. So the workshop would have looked something like these two images, which are not Shea, but um, the setup would have been roughly the same. 
And in the left side, you can see a lithography stone in the foreground. So you can get a sense of how enormous these stones were. And you can kind of imagine how heavy they would be to lift onto the press. And on the right is a steam powered press. And the stone is in the bed of the press and it moves back and forth. And then the paper drops down from that feeder tray on the top and it goes onto the stone. So that those types of presses allowed Shahoy to print really quickly as well. So around the same time that Shahoy merged with Shea, he was starting to receive quite a lot of critical attention in the press. And he eventually had his own solo exhibition in 1889. And then the French government recognized him for his contributions to lithography by naming him a Knight of the Legion of Honor in 1890. The 1890s were really the height of Chauvet's fame. And this was also a moment when a lot of poster, or a lot of print collectors, print connoisseurs started to also collect posters. And people had surreptitiously collected posters from the streets for years before that but poster collecting became more established in the 1890s as galleries started to sell posters as well. And along with that, Chauhe started to print editions of his posters on higher quality paper than they would have been to be pasted up in the streets. And he also started to create versions of his posters that had only the illustration without the commercial text. So you can see an example of that on the far right. Then in 1895, the uh, collector named Ernest Manton wrote the first scholarship about the illustrated poster, and he included a catalogue raisonné of all of Chauvet's graphic of to date. And Chauvet had a, quite an extensive graphic of, so by the end of his career, he had made more than 1,400 poster designs, and he also created pastels murals and decorative arts objects. So we had quite a prolific career. And as uh, we've been mentioning, the, uh, we recently finalized the gift of the James and Susie Whitman collection just about two weeks ago. So I'm very pleased to announce that to all of you. And the collection is made up of more than 600 posters, prints and drawings by Chahé. The Whitman started collecting works by Chauvet in 1983. And in the years since then, they've built up the most extensive collection of his work in the United States. So that's a very significant gift to be able to bring into the MAM collection. The gift from the Wickmans includes a very representative sample of Chauvet's poster art. So on the left, I'm showing you the earliest poster in the collection, and that was made in 1866, the same year that Chauvet founded his first press in Paris. And then on the right, there is one of the latest posters in the collection from 1911. Generally after 1900, Chauvet had stopped making posters because he became busier with his, um, with his decorative arts commissions. So um, it's a little bit rarer to see later posters like this. The collection includes more than 500 posters and I'll show you more examples of those once I start telling you about the exhibition. But with the, the gift also includes 13 pastels, drawings, and preparatory studies. So an example of a preparatory study is on the left, where it's a gouache that Chauvet would have used in order to work out his ideas for the design for the finalized poster, which you see on the right. There are also 63 covers, frontispieces, and illustrations for books, music, music sheets and publications, periodicals, so smaller prints. And then there are also nine works by other artists in the collection. And the Wickmans first promised their collection to the museum in the spring of 2016. And then the works started to arrive on site at the museum that fall. And in the four years since then, we've been working on housing, photographing, and cataloging all 611 works in the collection. So to date, about 410 of the works are photographed and all 611 are cataloged. And that's actually my first experience with 
the museum is doing hands-on work cataloging the Chauvet posters prior to being appointed as the assistant curator or the associate curator of prints and drawings. My predecessor, Brittany Salisbury, hired me as a research assistant. So one of my first tasks at the museum was to catalog the majority of the 611 works in the collection. So um, when they were in the Wickman's home, a lot of the posters were framed and a lot of them were stored in um, vinyl sleeves like this. So this is how many of them arrived to us at the museum. So cataloging the works involved removing the posters from these sleeves and then recording all of the text that appears on the poster in our collections database, examining the posters for stamps and inscriptions of any kind, we record those as well. And um, while we were doing this, we were deciding also on the conventions that we would use for titling the posters and how we would handle the different pieces of information. So that was an interesting task to be involved with right away. Once we are done cataloging the posters, we move them into new housing at the museum. So many of the posters are stored in drawers like this in a flat file unit. So there are folders inside of these drawers with five or six posters per folder. Some of the posters are eight feet tall. So for those, if they were framed, we kept them in the frames and they're stored on a rack. Even before I started getting hands-on work with the Chauvet posters, I started to gather some of the research materials for the exhibition. And so when Brittany, Brittany hired me to be a research assistant at the museum, I was finishing up a year of doing dissertation research and teaching English in France. So since I was present in Paris, Brittany asked me to look at a scrapbook of press clippings that Chauvet's family had maintained. And that was housed at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France or the BNF. So I went on site the BNF wouldn't let me look at the physical scrapbook. So instead I spent several days sitting in front of the microfilm machine. So what you're looking at is what I consider to be my self portrait as a researcher. So <laughs> you can see the French text and then the reflection of me with my phone, desperately taking pictures of, <laughs> of these pages of the microfilm machine. You can also see the gorgeous reading room of the Richelieu branch of the BNF in the background. So if that inspires you to go there, I hope that you will. I read most of the pictures that I'd taken once I returned to the US, but as you can see from this screenshot, the photos are not very good. So I can't read them very long <laughs> without getting a headache or going cross-eyed or something like that. But when I could see the text that I was reading, a word that kept coming up over and over again that I noticed in regards to Chauvet and his posters was ephemeral or ephemeral. So that word is circled for you. And I also saw the posters described as constantly renewable, which is underlined there, or always new. And so that's where the title of the exhibition comes from. And a lot of the critics who were writing about Chauvet's posters talked about how lucky they were if they saw the same poster design for more than a week at once, because once they were pasted up in the streets, these posters were subject to being stolen, rained on, getting dirty, getting torn, getting tattered. So one of my favorite descriptions that I've seen is by an English tourist who had traveled to Paris and he later wrote an article about Chauvet. So he says, it must be admitted, however, that all the admiration in the world cannot save these ephemeral productions from the fate of their kind. The very objects they announce are forgotten twixt sunset and sunrise. Their brilliant colors vanish under the wear and tear of the elements, not to mention the gratuitous insults of street urchins and the encroachments of rival posters, which swoop down by the hundreds and all the arrogance of fresh print and paint. So that's um, a really key quotation for me in thinking about the exhibition, because after reading that, I realized that not only are the posters themselves ephemeral, but so are most of the products that are being advertised. So I decided to take ephemerality as the major theme of the exhibition and examine how that related to ideas of modernity and also changing perceptions about the pace of life at the end of the 19th century.
And so the exhibition is called Always New, as I mentioned, and that is scheduled to open in June 2022 in the Baker Rowland Galleries. We're hoping that by then we'll all be safe to go out and gather and have a great experience at this exhibition. But the, we're, the show will feature approximately 100 posters from the James and Susie Wickman collection, and that will incorporate both Charest's iconic images and also some of his lesser known posters. So there will be five sections in the exhibition, and these sections all relate to a major subject area within Charest's graphic art of. So the first section will be Novelty Acts. The official title will be Novelty Acts, and then that encompasses cabaret performances. The next section is La Mode de Paris, which will cover fashion and department stores. There is also a section called The Dailies, which is about press and serialized novels. Voyage, which covers physical and virtual travel. And then consumables, which are consumer products. So I'll take you through those in a bit more detail. Prior to the first official section, I'm planning to have a little introductory moment where there will be information about Chauvet's background and also how posters would have been printed, distributed, and displayed. So these two posters will be part of that introduction. And both of these posters are for poster distribution companies. So they, they are called um, afficheurs. The word for poster in French is affiche. So the people who hang up the posters are called afficheurs. And the poster on the left promises to distribute artistic posters to any place in France within 72 hours. I'm also borrowing this painting by Louis Robert Carrier Belleuse for the exhibition from a private collector in the Netherlands. And I wanted to borrow this painting in particular because it gives a sense of how the posters would have been displayed in the streets. So rather than framed and meticulously spaced and arranged like they will be in the museum, this painting shows how Parisians might have encountered posters in the streets where they're kind of peeling off the wall, maybe torn as you see on the right side. I also wanted to borrow this painting because all of the images within the kind of green blue rectangles that I've just put up are recognizable designs by Chalet. And the designs range from 1879 to 1882. So it's unlikely that all of those designs would have actually been on display in the street at the same time. But even if it's not an entirely accurate representation of Chalet's presence in the street, it gives you and a sense of the hold that he had over the public imagination at the time. So following that introductory moment, we'll go into a section called Novelty Acts, and that will be about the explosion of cabarets and cafe concerts in Paris in the 1880s and 1890s. And most of those venues uh, featured performances that were scheduled to last only a couple of days or a few weeks. And several of these posters use that three stone lithography process that I was talking about. So you can see that in evidence here. The poster on the left of your screen is one of my very favorite in the exhibition. It's for Jefferson the Manfish. And I've been trying to figure out exactly what this performance would have entailed. And it's a little tricky to determine, but as far as I've been able to uncover so far, Jefferson was an American who performed underwater so he could hold his breath for a really long time and he could smoke a pipe, which you can see in his hand that he's holding up. And he would just do other kind of daily tasks underwater. And I'm not sure if he was physically submerged in water or if there were theatrical scrims that made it look like he was underwater. But nonetheless, this is one of my favorite posters partially for that mystery. And Chauvet in general was creating posters for cabarets that were relatively more upscale. So it's not like the Paris Opera or anything like that, nothing um, on that level, but within the scale of cabarets. He charged a little bit more for his posters. So he generally made ones for, uh, made posters for cabarets that were slightly more bourgeois. We also will be including this poster, which is probably Chauvet's most iconic work. 
Many of you have probably seen it. It's a poster for the Moulin Rouge. And this poster is also significant because it marks the one of the first appearances of a female figure known as the Charette, who became associated with Charette. And this female figure is really a fantasy. She's not really representative of how the everyday woman in Paris would have dressed. But instead, a lot of uh, the critics who are writing about her were very enthusiastic about the Charette, and they considered her to be an embodiment of French joy and culture. So she, you'll see her again later on. Chauvet turned the Charette into an advertising icon for the Musée Clévin, which was a wax museum that opened in Paris in 1882, and it welcomed half a million visitors each year. So it was an extremely popular attraction. Chauvet became artistic director of that venue in 1891. And at that point, he started to use the Chauvet in his advertisements for events that were taking place in the theater that was attached to the Musée Clépin. The next section will be on La Mode de Paris, and that will feature advertisements for clothing and toys that were sold in department stores. There's a little bit of background on this. Um, there, the, the urban landscape of Paris completely changed between 1850 and 1870. Baron Haussmann, who was the prefect of the Seine under Napoleon III, uh, undertook a complete renovation of the streets of Paris. So the, the little avenue that you see in the image on the left is a street that was raised in order to create room for these wider boulevards. So uh, Rue du Jardinet was raised in order to create the, Rue Saint, or the Boulevard Saint-Germain. So there were all of these new grand boulevards that radiated out from the Arc de Triomphe. And this renovation of the city created space to build a uh, grand magasin or department stores. So the image on the right that you're seeing is for, is the Bon Marché, which is one of these new department stores. And you can see how wide the street in front of it is. On the left side, you see an ad for the Grand Bon Marché. So I really enjoyed this advertisement because the man in the front is defying the rays of the sun because he's made this great purchase. And there's kind of a, sh a silhouetted figure in the background who's just sweating and mopping his forehead because he wasn't smart enough to make the same purchase. The, there were some also changes in the patterns of shopping that occurred at the time that the Clan Magasin were installed in the streets. And that involved allowing free admission into the department stores and also instituting fixed prices. So the practice of browsing and kind of fantasizing about the things that you would buy started to occur at this same time. Many of Chauvet's ads for the department stores feature the fashions of the day and they're advertising both custom clothing and off the rack clothing and very fashionably dressed women and men. The stores also advertise exhibitions of the seasons that were upcoming. So the Plantemps, the Clan Magasin du Plantemps is advertising the summer fashions and the winter fashions. So those exhibitions took place in the spring and fall respectively. A word that comes up fairly regularly in these ads for department stores is nouveauté, which is novelty. So that gives you a sense of the emphasis on constant change and new offerings that um, people expected from these department stores. Ads for toys are also common. So you see that on the right, a plan is a New Year's gift. So this little girl is completely delighted with her New Year's gift of dolls. And the subject of Etlen is also very relevant for the exhibition because New Year's itself is a holiday that marks the passage of time and the possibilities of new things to come. The next section will be the dailies, which is about newspapers and serialized novels. And the number, the circulation of newspapers increased 250% between 1880 and 1914 as literacy rates in France increased and the production costs of creating newspapers decreased. 
So there are quite a number of new daily newspapers. So these two posters are each for a different daily newspaper that was circulating in Paris. And with all of this new competition, newspapers often relied on serialized novels to help encourage subscriptions to their newspaper. So they would recruit some of the leading novelists of the day to write stories for them that they could publish on a daily or weekly basis to keep people coming back and reading the next installment of the story. And that often created a, a narrative that was somewhat fragmented and relied primarily on action and dialogue. You can kind of see that reflected in the designs that Chauffet made for these posters advertising serialized novels in newspapers, where there are people like in the middle of a fight or they're raising their arms in supplication. So there's um, quite a lot of drama in the posters as well as in the stories. The next section is Voyage, and that will be about both real travel and virtual travel. And as I mentioned, Chauvet became the artistic director of Shea in 1881. And you can see some remnants of the legacy of Shea as a railroad production company, because some of these ads that Chauvet created for travel destinations include railroad timetables in the corner. So you can see that in the poster on the right. In both of these posters, he's advertising destinations that can be reached by rail. And he's advertising for these vacations that, as we know, always seem to end a little bit too soon. This section will also encompass advertisements for goods related to travel. So the poster on the right is, or sorry, the poster on the left is for goods that you can order and have delivered by train. And the poster on the right is for a travel guide. The virtual travel component of this section has to do with entertainments that allowed Parisians to travel away from the city without physically leaving. So there are entertainments that had to do with other places or other times. And this was a very popular form of entertainment at the end of the 19th century. For example, the 1889 and 1900 World's Fairs in Paris each featured a section of the World's Fair that was dedicated to France's colonial holdings. And the, the organizers of the fair actually brought people from the territories to the World's Fair grounds to live and unfortunately be exhibited at the World's Fair. So people in Paris or who traveled to Paris could in some sense visit the colonies without actually going there. The advertisement on the left is for a pavilion at the 1900 World's Fair that's dedicated to Andalusian, the Andalusian region in the time of the Moors. So in that case, you're traveling to both a different time and a different place. And there will also be ads for panoramas and dioramas in this section. Both were popular forms of entertainment and they often featured historical battle scenes or uh, destinations that were a little further afield, like New York. And the last section of the exhibition is consumables. So this is a section that's about the new mass-produced consumer products that were introduced to the market that were meant to be used up and purchased over and over again. So Chauvet created advertisements for liquor, for cigarettes, for hair oil, for motor oil, and for beauty products. So some of these relied on celebrity spokespeople. So the ad on the right features Sarah Bernhardt, who was a very popular theater actress at the time. So she's powdering her face with this rice powder that's offered by La DFN. But several of these consumer product posters feature the chauffette in various guises. And this section will um, talk about the commercial culture in place at the time. And it will also talk about the changing role of women as consumers in Paris of the 19th century. There will also be a publication with the exhibition. So I'm in the midst of writing my own contribution to the publication now, but it will cover the uh, nature of, the ephemeral nature of Chauvet's posters and how that was received by the public and how it relates to ideas of modernity and changing perceptions of time. I've also invited two guest authors who are each experts in Chauvet and in posters. So the first is Ruth Iskin, who is Professor Emerita at Ben Gurion University in Israel. 
and her contribution to the catalog is looking specifically at Shofei's department store posters and talking about different types of female figures that he used to advertise. The other guest author is Virginie Vignon, who is the head of a new association of a few museums in Echirol, France, and it's called Tracé. So she just started that role recently but she is writing an essay about more of the technical components of Charest's printing operations and about how he established himself as a printer in Paris in the 1870s and 1880s. So all together to kind of sum things up, the exhibition is a celebration of Charest and of the poster. And it's also a celebration of the gift of posters from Jim and Susie Wickman. So it's a truly transformational gift and it's completely changed the, the collection and it will help to establish the Milwaukee Art Museum as an important center for the study of the poster going forward. So thanks very much for your attention. I'm very happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Nikki, that was wonderful. Um, and remember 600 of those um, posters and you can see the colors, you can see the, the range of subject matter. It's really, um, when you see these things in person, they really are um, marvelous just objects to, to look at, but they're also, there's, as Nikki just shared a little bit with us, there's, a, there's such an interesting story about advertising and um, the time period in which they were made. Um, Nikki, I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about um, the, the, the different scale that um, these posters come in. Sure, so as I mentioned, there are smaller prints, like book cover size, and some of those, book covers were turned into posters. So those are fairly small. I'm, I'm not great at telling you what a dimension of something is, <laughs> but they're about yay big. Uh, and then they range all the way up to eight feet tall, like I was showing you in one of the images. And that's the largest, the largest ones are eight feet tall. Yeah, those are fun to um, photograph. Right, yes, that was, I really owe a lot of thanks to our contract photographer, John Glenbin, and to Rebecca Morin, who helped to organize the photography sessions and to our conservation department, who did all the preparation that was involved in making them photo ready. So that was quite an undertaking. <laughs> we just finished photographing everything that will be used in the exhibition catalog this month also. So that's a huge achievement. Big milestone. So um, this would be a great time to submit any questions you have in um, the chat and I will read them. We have a number of them already submitted. Um, the first one, is from Dan and he wants to know, can you comment on the round advertisement kiosks on the streets? Sure, yeah, they were called Morris columns and that's um, to kind of describe them for anyone who hasn't seen them. It's a large cylinder that is probably eight to 10 feet tall and it's topped with kind of a dome shape. And those were, created kind of alongside the Osmanization of Paris in order to create a space to advertise. Um, there was a press law that was passed in 1881 that made it easier for, for publishers to hang up advertisements. You no longer needed to get approval for your designs in advance. So along with the influx of additional advertisements, there, were, there was also a lot of infrastructure that appeared in Paris in order to provide a space to hang the posters. So not only would they have been on the walls along the street, but they were also on these round Morris columns and they were also on specialized kiosks that were made and also urinals. So <laughs> there are all kinds of new, new infrastructures for posters at the time. That's great. Um, so I, there are a lot of, they're not questions, but they're comments, basically commenting on the Wickman's incredible generosity in giving this gift um, to the museum. And one question says, can you tell us more about the Wickman's enormous attraction to Charest? Um, also, is the, is the Milwaukee Art Museum already getting requests to loan some of these out? And then this questioner says, how exciting. <laughs> Oh, yes, it is extremely exciting. 
And that's, it's been a project that I've been really thrilled to work on since I started at the museum. The Wickmans first encountered Chauvet's work when they were visiting San Francisco. So they saw a poster by Chauvet and I think they both were just immediately attracted to the fun and the life that many of these posters exude. So it was sort of a love at first sight situation. And then they decided to dedicate their collecting to acquiring as many examples of Chauvet's posters as they could find. Um, Ray asks, how did Toulouse-Lautrec relate to Chauvet? He followed after Chauvet. Uh, so Chauvet's work helped to establish the poster as a medium that more artists wanted to pursue. So when it was first in introduced, it was considered to be a much more commercial product and artists weren't really interested in creating designs for something like that. So Chauvet was really the first person to apply a high aesthetic and artistic standard to the poster. So he was starting to do that in the 1870s and artists like Toulouse-Lautrec and the Nabi and some of the other later French artists um, really reached their height in the 1890s. So they were inspired by what Chauvet did and then they took it on and kind of pushed it into a new direction. So there's some evidence that Toulouse-Lautrec learned how to print from Chauvet. There's not a ton of evidence about that, but some people think that's the course of how, it, how that relationship went. But um, Toulouse-Lautrec really took on a new style. So he used quite a lot more simplified forms and gave the poster his own unique aesthetic treatment. But it's um, likely due to Chauvet that he considered making posters to begin with. Um, a question that asks, do we know how many of a single poster were typically printed when Chere was at his peak? I do, I don't have that information in it off the top of my head. Like we as a society know it, <laughs> it's recorded, but I just don't have the answer right now. Okay. Um, another question asks, where did the Wickmans collect most of the um, posters from? And that I don't actually know, I'm sorry. But mo uh, dealers, a lot of dealers. Yeah, sorry, um, dealers, but I don't know like the specific, de or, sorry, they did purchase several posters from Jack Rennert at um, Poster Auctions International. So I do know that one. Um, I was trying to think of some of the other specific dealers. I know they purchased in San Francisco and New Orleans but the other specifics beyond that are escaping me. Um, another question asks, um, other than these, the Charest posters, does the museum have um, an existing collection of posters and how do the Charest posters relate? Yes, we do have a nice selection of posters already. So many of those are often on display in the design galleries and uh, the posters, we have a large group of Enfle de Toulouse-Lautrec posters that were donated by Mrs. Harry Lynn Bradley in the 1970s. So we have posters by Toulouse-Lautrec and also smaller prints that she donated. And um, Dr. and Mrs. Milton Gutglass also donated posters starting in the 1980s and 1990s. So there, there, we have a group of posters that we regularly, regularly rotate out. And so this gift of posters by Chauvet expands on that pre-existing collection of posters quite significantly. And it also helps to tell a little bit more of the history of how posters came to be considered an artistic medium. Um, there's a question that says, why did they pick the Milwaukee Art Museum for this gift? Well, they, I should have mentioned, they are local collectors. And they were also encouraged in looking at Milwaukee as a site by Dick Goisman, who is uh, one of our patrons. And he is the Wickman's former neighbor and longtime friend. So he has been really instrumental in encouraging them to donate to the museum. And we're really grateful to him for that. And we're grateful to the Wickman's for deciding to, to give their collection to a local institution and um, preserve their legacy here in the city. Um, one question asks, is, were there any 
posters that had more than three colors. Yes, later on, after Shohei merged with Shea, he had the capacity to be able to do a little bit more complicated printing work. And especially once people started to collect posters, he could take more time to develop more complex designs. So eventually he starts to do more colored stones. Um, occasionally it's difficult to discern after the fact exactly how many stones went into printing, but it's more than three. So he did expand on his technical capacity later on. Um, someone asks if um, there'll be an opportunity to see the charade posters on view at the museum in a relatively regular capacity. Yes, we not we don't have anything specifically scheduled out, but we're planning to feature regular rotations of the Shahe posters. Those would likely begin after the exhibition. So we'll we'll continue to show them. And some may also go into those rotations in the design galleries as well. Great. Well, those are all the questions that I see. Um, obviously, summer of 22, what a great time to be able to hopefully get back together in person again. And what a fun show to program around. Um, the museum's hired a new curator of community dialogue. And in tandem with Nikki, they're going to come up with some wonderful programs um, for this exhibition. It has endless possibilities and they all center on fun, if you ask me. <laughs> um, and so Nikki, I just wanna thank you for all of your work, um, even before you came to the museum as a staff person on this project, but um, the, the depth and breadth of this collection really demands a lot of um, focus and a lot of dedication and um, you have hit the ground running in your position here and um, this exhibition and this collection could not be in better hands. Thank you. <laughs> um, so if we don't have any more questions, please do look for, um, you'll be hearing about the show in the coming year. The museum will keep people updated um, on the plans for the, the exhibition. So, um, and then mark your calendars for next June. All right, well, thanks everybody. Have a good night.